Mm. All right, let's go. Um, hey, welcome back, guys. This is season four, episode four. We're joined again by our honorary member, Craig. I think he's <laughs> been with us every season since the first, so it's really great to have him back. Craig, how are you and uh, how have you been going? Uh, I'm good, and I hope I'm I'm back for after you guys got on a two-season hiatus and then you have a reunion show. And they bring everyone back and we all look older. <laughs> that'd be cool. <laughs> High school reunion all over again. So the, the meme squad's gonna have a long run. I'm thinking 25 seasons. Maybe. Let's <laughs> let's hope. But I wanted to ask. I'll be a babushka if... by then. <laughs> I already have the cane for it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um well. Look, it's always good to have you on the show. And I guess since it's like, it has been a while since we last had the episode with you last season. I think you were back at the start of season three and now we're in season four. And I want to ask you, what have you been doing in that time? Uh, what academia have you been focusing on? And I know you've written a book, so we're going to get into that. Um, I had it. So for those of you watching, Craig was kind enough to send us copies of the book, promotional copies, just free of charge and reading that book was very like I very much liked how he structured it based on the centuries if you don't know what it is we're going to get into that but before we do um, what have you been studying in the meantime Craig so I'm assuming you just haven't been doing the book is there anything else you've been doing I've been putting finishing touches on something that's treated in the book um, an article on the letter of Pope Adrian to the Council of Nicaea II um, that pretty much demonstrably proves Anastasi librarians' uh, forgeries, you know, from, I don't want to bore you guys, but from like original Latin manuscripts and stuff. It's, it's uh, really cool. Um, and I was contacted by Scriptorum Press in, uh, from Quebec, Canada, and uh, Evangelos from that outfit has pretty much created the thesis, which I have come to fully endorse the authenticity of the Dionysian corpus. And this, this is, I think, the biggest discovery, or it's not discovery because it's, it's just new arguments and better arguments, but it's the most important thesis of, in church history of the century. And it probably will remain so. It's hard to have a more important thesis if you understand who, say, Denis Ariopagite was, um, who the church thought he was, and what he meant, and how that affects the discourse uh, from here on in. It's it's incredible. Um, I've already had a show on my channel about it, um, and Scriptorum Press already has uh, a lot of the arguments delineated in the book, and it's like fourteen bucks on Amazon. So I think anyone could buy it, and that's the physical copy, by the way. But um, I can also speak to that a lot of work has been done since then, um, detailed work that just this thesis, the deeper you dig, the more solidified it gets. It's really incredible. So with regards to that, how, how, will, the, how will the Dionysian corpus affect how we view things in general? Why is it so important? Well, for one, I mean, when we get into, let's just for the sake of argument, accept the authenticity of the Dynastian Corpus. If the Dynastian Corpus is authentic, what we find is the whole philosophical school of Neoplatonism is indebted to Christian philosophy, and which turns in the head a lot of people's assumptions that uh, Christianity is this kind of, you know, religion that wasn't that of the intellectuals. And over time, they borrowed philosophical ideas and made a more intellectually vigorous ideology. Uh, but the real history, which I think is, is brought up by this article, is there is incredible dependence in Plotinus and Proclus, who, a later Neoplatonic writer, on Origen and Dionysius. And that being the case, it changes the whole study of ancient Greek philosophy after the time of Christ, because it actually then necessarily weds it to Christian writers. It's, it's very incredible just from that vantage point. But let's just like even think of other things mentioned in passing the Denisian corpus where it's really not its main point. 
but St. Denisius defends the use of icons. We have a first century source that defends the theology of iconodulia. Okay. Oh, wow. so, but it's, yeah. it's a first century source. We have, uh, well, to be fair, it could be the first decade of the second century, but a first, second, second century source. Uh, he speaks of monasticism and the tonsure. So it's not like this is some later development. Um, this is something that existed in the first century. And we have very precise etymological reasons, and to speak more plainer English, um, we have very precise word studies that scholarship accepts that shows this could have only come from the first century, not what earlier scholarship, the 80s, 90s was saying from Syria in the fourth, fifth century. Mm. And so what we have is due to the work of recent scholarship and the genius of Evangelos of putting this all together is a, a mountain of evidence where really to deny the authenticity of the Denisian corpus becomes untenable. And so I don't expect I'm going to have a lot of Protestants willing to debate me on this. This, this offer has been out for a while, just like I don't have a lot of Roman Catholics willing to debate me on topics of the rise and fall of the papacy because the facts are there. Uh, but the, this is going to eventually trickle down and um, I, we're working on getting this published peer reviewed so that way we could start. It's one thing to, to rule the interwebs, but it's another thing to start changing the academic discourse. Okay, so look, I, I think I really want to get deeper into that later in this episode because that is, that is a big deal. If, it, if it's authentic and that that body of text exists, that's, that's amazing. Um, but before we do that, we're going to go into the book that you've written. And I have one question before that. So with regards to apologetics, what's a misconception? Because I'm not an apologist. And most of us here, we like to interview apologists and see what, what they've been doing, what they've been studying. What's a misconception that you see or want to clear out about apologetics in general? Um, well, that, that's a good question. I, what uh, apologetics classically is, is a defense, an explanation of the faith. So for all the youngins out there, apologetics isn't people debating and arguing with one another for fun. There could be a entertaining element to it, of course. Apologetics isn't even really entertaining memes making a point that advances orthodoxy or name your ideology here, which all memes do. Um, but apologetics classically has been defending the faith. And, you know, so let me just get to like what we're doing on YouTube. We're trying, this is a format that needs to be fun. I'm already being too boring, right? So it's a format that's fun. That's the point of Orthodox Meme Squad, for example, is to do something serious, but in a fun way. But we don't want to do something serious. We don't, we don't want to do something that's fun, but do it in an evil way. And I think that's become a real concern in apologetics last five years is we've seen a decreasing degradation in the quality of apologetics, where it's just the apologetics of personal destruction, essentially. It's not talking about the points or making clever observations about the points. It's almost attacking the messenger as if, let's say, I'm the worst scoundrel in the world. Would that change, you know, the content of this book? And the answer wouldn't be. It wouldn't. You know, you, you'd have to judge the book by its merits or the arguments about Denisius on its merits has nothing to do with me or any other apologist. But because of the entertainment aspect, it's just like what we see in TV news, everything just has gone just full sophistry. And so it's ad hominems, non secateurs, things that have nothing to do with actually addressing the points and advancing the arguments, which is why for the years I've been doing this, I've always... I've given whole episodes to Protestants and Roman Catholics to defend their case because I feel this is important so that way we could actually get someone, we could understand what the real position is so then we could oppose the real position, not simply like, oh, well, I've heard that person had an out of wedlock kid, you know, that person's 300 pounds or, or things that are irrelevant that we hear all the time. Um, I don't, I think focusing on these things isn't edifying. I think it's actually dangerous spiritually. 
Yeah, look, I think yeah. that was very well said and we can all agree with that. Mary, what were you going to say? Sorry, I interrupted Oh, you. yeah, no, no, it's all good. I was just going to say I agree. Yeah, I've I've run into so many people online who are more there, not for like, like a fruitful conversation or a debate, but just to look down the nose of the other person. It's more of an ego boost more than like, actually wanting to learn more about the church or whatever it's just like oh i need to be more pious or holier than thou because i know better it's like in the a lot of these debates i've seen tend to like turn into uh petty insults and stuff and just falls apart i mean it's funny mary because it's also the weakness of men on this topic we we get very combative even if it's about like things that are allegedly virtuous and mm -hmm. so my wife did a video on my channel and people, of course, because it's apologetics, they're debating and criticizing one another. And my wife writes, like, not how I would write, right? Because she's a woman. She writes, mm -hmm. friends, let's not be tearing each other apart. Let's think about this. And it diffuses <laughs> everything. So I think a lot of the problem is just that's how guys do things. I think you're the only person I've ever seen <laughs> that's female or anything mm -hmm. orthodox on the YouTube that I watch. So that might be part of it, but it's, uh, but men need to have humility, right? Men need to have patience. It's actually effeminate for men to, to lose their cool, right? The old school thing is for like a man to not show their emotions, not wear them on his sleeves. Oh, yes. I'm not that sort of old school guy, but that's what we should be striving to be. Mm. Also, that's like the big part of that masculine urge to like prove it. Like no matter, let's say, a different thing like a, they have a, a discussion about something else like everyone at that at least once in their life that they were like even though i'm it, it's not that good what i'm doing i'm gonna just prove it just for the sake of it in serbian we even have a word for that i'm gonna do something even though it's not good we call it inat that's what like a very big thing that serbians have for example that's just like proving something even though you know it's the wrong thing that you're gonna do well it's i remember and i've seen this more than once actually you know young men getting to apologetics and like i haven't read the bible yet like, then what are we doing here <laughs> right that's <Yeah>. like <laughs> and i and one guy actually said oh i had i found it fun to argue about this and like well then that's the wrong reason to get into it. it's one thing like right you're into it already and then you have conviction and that's what makes you argumentative to get into it because it's a uh, oh this sounds like something fun that i could argue about is kind of like i don't know it makes no sense how could you feel that invested in it to get angry and heated mm -hmm. you know unless this means a lot to you and it and it's been a big part of your life for a long time um i know that in calvinism in american like calvinism they call it cage stage calvinism it's kind of common with new converts um, in the Orthodox tradition, uh, new martyr Daniel Sezoya felt that what to do with that cage stage energy was to use it for evangelism. So go do street missions with that sort of, uh, you know, you could still be a catechumen and preach the gospel. You just do so the blessing and the teaching of your priest. And so there's proper ways to channel that enthusiasm. And then there's stupid ways. And I think with the internet, you put a big magnifying glass over everything stupid that happens to the whole world. So we see a lot of stupid ways it happens too. So, yeah. like I, you mentioned I, I, earlier, you sorry. finish. Yeah, like you mentioned earlier, humility is a big part of it. Like uh, for me, for example, I I can't even watch debates. I'm like, oh, I have no patience for that. But like sometimes I get, I remember I once tried watching a debate on theology, and I was like, after like five minutes. Hey, this got me so annoyed. I can't watch it anymore. <laughs> I felt like it was harmful even watching for me. And I, mean, I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, these remember... things like... Oh, sorry? No, no, you go right ahead. No, oh, talking. yeah, like... Uh, sorry, but yeah, the, there's just so many people, especially like ortho bros online, who just go into like apologetics and go like, like, you know, try to argue and debate and like defend the church without even having the blessing of their spiritual father at all. And um, some of them haven't even read the Bible in full 
and yet they're still like they're, they're trying to go into really heavy like you know theological topics and it's just yeah they need they need guidance they shouldn't like a lot of these guys I noticed just really shouldn't be doing these things at all really like if you even question them a little bit on their on like if like they have guidance from their spiritual father it's like if they don't then like what are you doing here and there's yeah. there's cult like yeah. things i've seen people say i won't be your spiritual father but i'll be your e spiritual father like so wait a second. so some random anonymous guy online is going to be giving you advice about what you're doing online one oh. who would listen to that person and two who would want to step into that position right that's that's pretty presumptuous that you could guide you'd be guiding people oh, you gosh. know like I, you guys must get it because you're, you know, you're public figures now. And, you know, I'm a public figure now, at least in the small sphere of the world that, you know, we operate in. And people come to me and stuff. And I, I pretty much tell them, like, listen, I'm just some guy with an opinion. You know, I, I don't ask for your adherence to me or anything like that. And, um, but some people, I think they just get off on the power trip because whatever else they got going in their lives, this is the one thing they feel important at. And um, I don't know, at the end of the day, right, like, I'm married. I got a job. I got a kid. I got, I got stuff in church to worry about, you know? And so the last thing I want are, is a cult of personality around myself. And so, but some people thrive off that and the internet, I think what we're seeing is cults, but not like people in a trailer somewhere waiting for the UFO behind a comet or something crazy. It's Discord servers and it's super chats and it's monetized and it's organized. You don't need to be all the trailer in Montana to be in a cult anymore. You could, you could be anywhere in the. You could be every country, every continent on Earth other than Antarctica, and be doing it. And so, I think all of us have to be mindful of this because I think the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We we want to further church, defend correct doctrine, evangelize. But then all these personal things get in the way, money gets into the way, pride gets into the way. And, you know, and it's, yes, we need to listen to our spiritual fathers, but some spiritual fathers are just not that attuned to this. So they'll just do whatever you want. I'm not, I'm not going to accuse this person's not listening to their spiritual father. They might very well be. Um, and what we can't be as such slaves or spiritual fathers, unless we're monastics, <laughs> Where like if we see the fruits of what we're doing and it's hurting people, unless we're absolutely put under obedience, we have to hold ourselves accountable. We have to evaluate our own faith, our own actions. And um, I know it's it's something we have to be mindful of if we're going to be doing serious work in apologetics. I mean, you know, I think for for what it's worth, I think the person who makes cartoons with Pepe the Frog is, should be held to a different standard uh, than a guy writing books. And so I probably I probably fall far shorter um, than I should, considering the standards I should be meeting myself. So I don't say this to condemn other people. I say this to condemn what I'm seeing and what we ought to be doing better. Yes. Um, and it's great that you said that and you brought up the book because that's what we're going to talk about now. <laughs> so <laughs> <On to the book. laughs> with the rise and fall of the papacy, look, when I had a read of it, I really, really liked the structure. I've said this before, but just the fact that you broke it down by centuries building up to the schism was really good because you want to see how this thing developed. And most people like they try and pretend that it's like a one point in time thing. It happened in like the 11th century and then that's it. They just did whatever afterward. But no, this wasn't like one thing that broke the camel's back. It was a build up to this and there was a historical papacy. And obviously if you're Orthodox, you're going to argue that that papacy is not infallible and not supreme. And you can see that in the sources that you've provided in the book. What made you want to break it down like that and present it in such a manner? What was your and what was your inspiration to to deal with this topic of apologetics? The the real inspiration was, I think, the best book on the Roman Catholic side, which is Scott Butler and John Colorado's Keys Over the Christian World. It was just super thorough. It covered everything con consecutively until um, the triumph of Orthodoxy. 
And essentially, I read that. I'm like, man, we need an orthodox version of this, but I'll never be able to write it. Right? I, I, that, that was the first thing I said, I'll never be able to do this. Hopefully someone one day can. And I had the author of that book on my channel, and I started doing uh, episodes, uh, a century an episode with him. And I started realizing, wait, this is going to be the, these are the bullet points to a book. If I flesh out, I add the sources, I add the block quotations, I add the explanations. And so it kind of grew organically where I put together something that otherwise I didn't think I was able to put together. Um, but the big Eureka moment I felt was identifying the epistemology of the church. Now, epistemology is a big word, right? So it's the theory of how we know something's true. And so we sort of, a Protestant epistemology is, if it's in the Bible, it's true. Now, that's not wrong. It's just not encompassing enough of what we know is true in Christianity, right? Now, in Roman Catholicism, it's, if it's in the Bible, if it's in tradition, and if it's from a pope, it's true, right? Ex cathedra, you know, sort of statements from the pope. So they have this wider definition. Now, in orthodoxy, we have scripture and sacred tradition, and they make this um, harmonious whole. But then you start getting to the more narrow questions. Well, what is what is most um, important in tradition? And this kind of reverses back to, I think, our first episode on this channel. Um, and there's a lot of confusion about this, because in Roman Catholicism, there's these weighted authorities. They even weight their canons. And people just presume we do the same thing. But if you like read any Orthodox theologian worth their salt, they don't deal theology that way. They're, they're quoting hymns as if they're, they're authorities that settle questions. Um, you, you'll read writers like Dositheus II in Jerusalem. He's quoting the Mensa Councils. Uh, 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 the Palmite Council in 1351 does the same thing. It quotes the minutes, considering that it settles the question. And so we see this Orthodox approach to tradition that's more holistic. It's not like, oh, well, it's the decrees, the canons, the councils, and it, and it all just kind of goes down in a hierarchy from below there. But it's almost like we, we accept everything. And everything harmonizes, and that's what makes it work. And so, but how do you describe that to people? And so the terminology I came up with, which comes up again and again in the book and in the fathers, is consensus. That is the magic word. If you understand, well, the consensus of the fathers, the consensus of the saints, the consensus of councils on the question, that's what settles it for Christians. Um, then you start seeing, well, wait, that's how we know what the Bible is. That's how we know what the ecumenical councils are. That's how we know um, what our Marian doctrines are. And on and on you go. Um, all of them are based on consensus. And so I, instead of writing a book about why the papacy is not true, I decided I'm going to write a book about what the consensus belief the church was and where Rome fit on this. Um, okay. So... With regards to the book, what is the period that, because in the title, what's the period that you define as the fall of the papacy? When do you see that as happening? Particularly, it would be after um, 860 or so during the papacy of Pope Nicholas. The Fodian and, season, basically. Yeah, the, it, but it's wasn't Photius who started the schism. <laughs> it was a, the, another Roman schism, actually. And to make it very simple, we see Rome having a consensus-based ecclesiology and a consensus-based epistemology all the way through, through all of these arguments and uh, divisions between East and West. It's consistent until 860, and that's where it really starts changing. And so um, the book identifies how it changes, who's the guy changing a lot of stuff, at least in the manuscript record, who's Anastasis, the librarian. And it's, uh, I think the surprising part is it's, you don't think, oh, one guy could change so much stuff. And I would say in a sense, he didn't, right? Obviously, Rome was the Vatican States now. Rome was under, you know, Frankish control. Then after that, they're looking to insulate themselves from even Frankish and Byzantine control. So we see these sort of motivations that would make you want to strike out an independent path and be self-sufficient uh, in ecclesiastical sense. And so, you know, the book, that's why it's so important to start from the first century because you get to see it develop in kind of real time, so to say, 
So it's just not out of nowhere. It's not just a conspiracy theory. It's just naturally where it went. And um, I think that's only possible seeing the whole big picture by going from the beginning and, and taking the walk through all of history. So, cause I'm sure there's going to be people that get the book and they're just looking for, I want the answer to what Eric Yerbara says about the formula Hermistas. I want the answer to what Alan rule says about the ladder in 649. And they're just going to open the table of contents and then they're going to turn right to that and read it. And, you know, I'll find a dandy, you'll find information there, but, I'm not sure how you took it, but my point as a writer was you really got to understand the whole thing because everything connects and it makes reading the whole book worthwhile. It's not just a reference source. So with regards, I'm going to ask two questions. The first one is what is this whole, like, because I've noticed there's this, this like circle of Eric Yavara, Michael Lofton and you, what is that? <laughs> like, what, where did that start oh, that's from? It. Well, we want. Well, we were once all in the same show. We were the beginning of reason and theology. Um, I was uh, Mike at that time was the token undecided guy, and the voice of reason. He didn't speak that much. He would just more interject and give frame both sides. I was the orthodox token orthodox guy, and Yabaro was the token Roman Catholic guy. And so it's sort of like how rock band genre jump. Essentially, reason theology genre jumped, and they became a you know a cringe a Roman Catholic Vatican II Pope Francis you know uh, defense channel right. And while most Roman Catholic apologetics said they're all invested in defending the papacy, they'll defend the papacy that doesn't exist, just one that exists on paper. And so, to Mike Lofton's credit, he's not pretending to be a fake trad, right? Like. He's like, well, if I'm, if I'm a papist, I got to be down with the whole thing. And, and that's essentially what he's doing. And it's, and it's more lucrative than being the impartial, let every side have a say, like it so began. But that, you that, said, that's how it began. You said he was the token, like, in-betweener guy. When did, you, when did he, like, swap? Well, it's interesting. You know, it's, these are good questions. Because I got to know Mike Lofton before Reason Theology just simply because he was – Greek Orthodox. That's how he identified that time. As far as I know, he was received by a Greek Orthodox mission in Louisiana. But, um, you know, did you ask to see my credentials? You asked to see anyone's credentials on the internet? Um, at, at least, you know, my Episcopal blessings on my website because my bishop made me do it. So, like, it's so you can find out if you look for it. But the point is, like, I don't advertise that stuff and I don't ask other people. I just judge it on their merits. Um, and so that being said, it's, I knew him as Orthodox and he was very much convinced against the papacy, which is so interesting. He actually told me something I never forget. And I told him I'd steal it from him with his permission. And he said, I give you permission. And it was this, he said, papal apologetics is shooting the arrow and then painting the arrow around it. And so I like to say it shows how much they ad hoc things. So you give an explanation They, you know, you say, well, how about this, you know, Pope Gregory the Great um, opposed the term ecumenical patriarch because he was against universal jurisdiction. He was against the universal bishop. And they'll just start ad hocing. And they, they'll say, well, if you interpret the words this way, because we have something from 500 years later where that's a different category of thought, we can look at it now this other way, even though this whole way of thinking would have been alien to Pope Gregory the Great's time. So it shows that Lofton was full aware that that sort of ad hoc approach to apologetics is how Roman Catholics applied um, themselves to everything. And so I have to be honest, I was very naive. I was very surprised that, you know, you could come to that realization and then apostatize and in his case, revert back to Roman Catholicism. Um, he wasn't very open about it. I won't get to more personal details, but I even said, I think you'd be happier as a union. And I won't tell you his response, but I'll just say he became a union <laughs> and he went and he wasn't telling me he wasn't telling me he was right. And so it shows it seems to me that um, ultimately they he went in a different direction. But I think in general, um, reason and theology just wasn't staying true to their mission. They weren't being honest to one another. And as a result, just like a rock band it breaks apart. Um, but I wasn't Yoko. And they diss each other, and then they, they make a mission of dissing each other afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
Bring back the original crew onto the meme squad, and we can all see. I'm a big enough man. I'll pretend it never happened, and let's just have an old school episode of Reason and Theology on neutral ground. <laughs> um, and I and I think the fact that I'm willing to do it despite all the horrible things they've done to my face, behind my back, and everything, I think it's a pretty good indication that I didn't start it. And I'm old school. I think the one who started it, it says fault. So if my kid said, well, the other person started it, I'm like, well, your fault, so you got caught, but I will take into account that you didn't start it. <laughs> well, look, the, the reason I ask is just because I see so many references to it, even you just referenced that people just want the response to Eric Yabara, which means that like, it's well known enough, I guess. Um, but I wanted to ask, when you were writing this book, did you find any lesser known aspects of that part of history that you think is important or that is new grounds, something that you might not find at first glance? Well, I think, uh, and this is to, you know, this is something where I'm surprised. I don't see myself as this great thinker or something like that. But the, I mean, who before me talked about Anastasis Liberian being the chief architect behind the papal claims. Um, now, before this book was published, but it was after it was written, a Greek scholar, Evangelist Chrysos, finally did make that statement in one of his 2023 articles. So now I'm not alone in at least explaining that this is what was occurring in the 860s and 870s. Um, but that is something new. If it's something where literally the first published peer-reviewed scholar to talk about this is Evangelist Chrysos, and I was on the other Paul's channel seven months beforehand saying the same thing. Um, this is brand new ground. I also think like other stuff in the book, like uh, I show in the baptism controversy, what really happened, how Rome reformed their baptismal practice. We see Orthodox tearing each other apart on, are there valid baptisms outside the church and aren't they? And then they get history into it and their understanding the history is all wrong. I would say on both sides. And so my interest in the question, it was not so much the baptism question, it was what was the role of the Episcopacy during this? But in doing that, you find out the answer to the baptism question and what caused that was creating that debate at that time. And so that's new grounds in this book. Um, I'd even say to something real simple, the, the whole issue, the schism, um, well, the excommunication of Rome uh, against Ephesus we always hear it's about Pascha, but in reality, it was about jurisdiction. These are things that you don't hear anywhere else, and it, uh, it comes up in the book. I would say this one thing is, uh, I know they talk about ortho bros, but it's kind of like the Roman Catholic version. I mean, I'll call them Romo Red bros. The Rad right? I'm going to call them Romo bros, because I like what it reminds <laughs> me. And so... The Romo bros, you know, just came up with uh, this video on the Miletian schism. And you read their comment section and they're just going wild. They feel like, you know, they had this winning combination. It was really well produced, by the way. And so I'm like, you know what? I already wrote a book about this. I'm going to purposely do a reply video. If you know anything about apologetics, it's a whole genre of videos. It's a reply and like make the other person look like they're wrong about everything. So I'm going to make a reply video hours after this thing debuted. It was already going gangbusters. And the only reason I could do that is because I already thor thoroughly dealt with the topic in this book. And um, so I really feel to someone who's like, listen, I just want something that's going to address this whole question for me thoroughly. I really feel this book will do it with you where you're, you're not going to have to watch a million videos or buy a million books. Um, I really confidently feel that, you know, if you buy this book at Amazon and you read this book and you don't feel that this is the best book in this topic, you can ask Amazon for their money back. <laughs> for your money back from Amazon. I'm not going to give it to you, but you get the point. <laughs> well, just having some fun, people. Just having some fun. <laughs> well, with your book, what was your target audience? Who are you directing it at? That's a good question. It's really directed at, I would say, interested people that are educated. If you read it, it's like it's trying to prove a point against certain academics and stuff like that. Um, but I'm aware that's not my main customer. And so I know my main customer is going to be inquirers mostly, right? 
who's right, the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church? And they're going to buy Lofton's book or your buyer's book, and they're going to buy my book, and they're going to read them next to each other. And I'm fine with that. And I, and I know that's my main customer. But that wasn't specifically the audience. It's, it's more thoroughly a history book than an apologetics book. Well, what I will say is from uh, Yabara's book and Lofton's book, I think Yabara's book is much better crafted, to be blunt with you. Uh, I think that that's the one that they'd be comparing with your one um, as a head-to-head. Um, but in general, I think people just want the answer. Like most people don't don't even care about this argument stuff they just want to know what's correct or what's true and i really appreciate it in that book how you've structured it going by century by century is way better than like i throw out a quotation that i found and you throw out a quotation this way people can actually see um chronologically how you got to that point because a ninth century quote from the roman catholic church from the roman catholic from the roman patriarchy is going to be not on the same level as like a first century, I don't know, Antiochian quote, in my opinion. So it's great that you've structured it like that. And with regards to that, do the Dionysian, I'm going to kind of link there now, does the Dionysian corpus in any way correlate to this whole topic? Well, it does, um, but it wasn't something that really weighs into the analysis of, of this particular book. Um, this book argues from first and second century sources how the early church was Episcopal, how it worked essentially based on jurisdictions that came from where the apostles were. And so we have like patriarchates before they were called patriarchates. And I feel convincingly proves this case. And so a lot of scholarship, but I've even seen some Western, uh, some Eastern Orthodox English speakers argue that the early church really was crypto Presbyterian. Um, and that's not correct. You know, the early church was Episcopal. There really was a Pope of Rome. There really was a Pope of Alexandria. Even if they didn't call themselves that at the time, there was a bishop in that city, and that was his jurisdiction. And the Denisian corpus merely adds to that mountain of evidence uh, because St. Denisius takes for granted the Episcopal nature of the church. Um, and so while scholarship, because they've been imbibing, I think, wrongly with this idea that the early church was actually this uh, kind of Presbyterian model, we say, well, this proves the anachronistic nature of the Denisian corpus. I argue that the explicit evidence, the Ignatian epistles, St. Clement, I even give the probability, the probability of St. Ignatius writing to um, six churches and all of them just so happened to, when he identifies the name of the bishop, have one bishop is one out of 36. So like, and he's writing to six different churches throughout the Christian world. So like, what are the chances that we have this Presbyterian model of church governance, but only when Ignatius wrote the six churches, they happen to be Episcopal and there was a diversity on the way. I mean, that's silly. Um, and so what we just see from St. Denisius is more detail of exactly the liturgical function of the bishop and the hierarchy of bishops and how that reflects heavenly hierarchy. You know, there's a book called Celestial Hierarchy um, in the Denisian Corpus. And so we see how uh, a, a first and second century thinker um, gave a theological justification for the ecclesiastical uh, organization of the first century church, which is still the Orthodox Church today. So I think that's very concise. And with regards to the Dionysian corpus, does it break down at all like different uh, patriarchates or does it just go up to the level of bishop? It doesn't go beyond that. It just goes up to the level of bishop, if I remember right. It's been about three years since I read the Dionysian corpus. It, it just goes up um, to the level of bishop. And because uh, remember, you know, Denisius is the bishop of Athens, which was, you know, not a nowhere city. He writes to a couple of living apostles um, like uh, St. Titus, St. John. Um, he writes to other bishops. And so we see a bishop doing what a bishop does and his understanding of what the episcopate is and how he views himself versus, so to say, other living bishops who were even apostles. Um, and so 
it's it gives us a good window that's just consistent with all of our other first, second century evidence. So I know that the like lots of people claim that it's not authentic. Obviously, that's what we're talking about. But people um, attribute other writers to Dionysius as a form of pseudo, like pseudo writers. Uh, they've inserted it after kind of like, I don't know if you're familiar with the apostolic constitutions and the apostolic canons, Yes, but the mm -hmm. church actually yeah. rejects the apostolic constitutions as being like completely authentic because there is evidence they've been tampered with. At least the constitutions, yeah. the canons are accepted. The constitutions are a different story. Um, yeah. Do you think there's like, how do you respond to people that make claims like that about the Dionysian corpus? Well, the existence of other forgeries, quasi-forgeries, things that have had forged interpolations or additions, um, of course it exists among some early documents. There's entire letters of St. Ignatius that have been added to his corpus that we don't accept today. So of course that exists. The question is, just because it exists doesn't put into doubt everything ever written in the early church. Um, and so then... Because that's the case, we have to evaluate the Dionysian corpus on its own merits. And what we find is there's fourth century texts that cite aspects of the Dionysian corpus explicitly. They say they're citing someone and it matches the Dionysian corpus. We have from the second century um, onward, in every single century, exact lexical parallels of works um, that come that match the Nicene corpus. We have the Nicene corpus um, having lexical parallels in both Proclus and Plotinus. Now, here's how, this is where like someone who's getting really deep in the weeds um, would know what's significant here, what's not. Because the lazy apologists could say, well, I think Dionysia, Dionysius is authentic because it's chicken egg, right? You know, you could say everyone copied Dionysius, or you could say that Dionysius copied everyone, and the saints say Dionysius is real, so he came before everything else, right, without dealing with the textual basis. Now, the scholars almost work the opposite way so far, right? Um, not all Orthodox scholarship, by the way. Um, Father uh, Dimitri Staniloy, um, in one of his last published works before he died, defended in detail the authenticity of the Nicene Corpus. And he was a scholar in the 90s. So we're not talking ancient history. I mean, you guys are young. I'm guessing maybe you're born in the 90s. Or is that too far back, yeah, right? Yeah. It's the 90s, <laughs> right? Yep. So it's like, you were alive yeah, then, you were a kid. But to me, that is an ancient history. I remember music, TV, everything from the 90s. And so... We had mainstream scholarship and, you know, and Father Dimitri will probably be canonized within a year's time. So he'll be a saint defending the Nicene Corpus in recent memory. Um, and it's on the basis, um, Father Dimitri, that the, the corpus has philosophical concepts from the first century. But we find that there's even Attic Greek tenses that are in common usage among philosophers in the first century that are gone by the fifth century. But they're in the Nicene Corpus. So what's more likely that some writer in the fifth century made an anachronistic vocabulary on purpose to trick everyone and borrowed things from all these writers in the past and scoured fathers for obscure mess uh, for obscure passages where that father says, as it's written somewhere and then quotes Dionysius and then ar arrogates the quote to himself, but we never since found where the quote really came from or we just accept he really wrote in the first century. And that explains why there's Attic Greek tenses that aren't anachronistic. It explains why we have the lexical parallels that proceed after it. It explains why when Proclus copied it, he only he copied only really one chapter of the Denisian corpus. So you hear all this stuff about Proclus, it's almost all in one chapter, in one book. And yet when Plotinus did it, it's throughout the Aeneids, right? And so if... Denisius was a pseudo and he was a forger, then why does his style of forgery differ between Proclus and Plotinus? It's more likely that Proclus and Plotinus are two different people and the way they borrow text differed, right? Not that a singular person was schizophrenic and he, and he copied it one guy's way uh, stuff one way and the other. So you start getting this mountain of evidence where it becomes untenable. 
And there's a lot of Orthodox that have their whole lives, their whole education, the Nicias has been a pseudo. And so they're not going to jump on board with this because it requires admitting they were wrong and admitting they never came up with this. But this this uh, young man, Evangelos, came up with the goods and both him and I have um, went through the scholarship, Syriac word studies, Greek word studies. Um, even a, a monk friend of mine found the term therapeutic, that's a early term for a monk, in Strabo. So it's in both Philo, which is seen in the scholarship, but I've never seen anyone else mention, well, it's also in Strabo. So we start seeing, wait a second, Denisius is using a word that had common usage in the first century and no common usage after that, as Eusebius notes a few centuries later, speaking of, um, speaking of the uh, therapeutic. So it's, um, it's a very important thesis. I am really convinced that there's no one that could put this in dispute in the apologetics world because they're not well read up enough on it. And so at this juncture, it's really for us to prove to the scholars. And that's what we're concerned about. So I think the last question I want to ask on this topic is, what's the most important part of this corpus in academia? You've said that it, you think it will advance academia, and I would agree with you. But what do you think is the most important topic that's brought up? Um, we have the epis, like the um, episcope, we have the... Um, references to icons are there any others that it might uh, shed some light on yeah so we talked about icons the episcopate there's other things like um anthropology and soteriology right so eastern orthodoxy has a very advanced um soteriology a very particular anthropology so soteriology is the theory of how we're saved anthropology is how human nature works since the fall, right? So that's what we call these things. And so these things aren't later Orthodox developments. They're from the first century. They're in Dionysius. And so now it's sort of like when you hear from um, Protestant apologists like James White that Orthodoxy has a sub-biblical anthropology, he says. Well, how do you explain Denisiabrigite from Acts chapter 17 without making an appeal of authority and just saying, oh, well, it's just a forgery. I'm telling you it's not a forgery. I'm telling you I got the evidence. If you weigh the evidence, you find, wait, the evidence is there. Now, how do you explain the fact that we got a first century Orthodox soteriology, first century Orthodox anthropology? It starts begging the question, why aren't you Orthodox if the, if the people taught by the apostles were Orthodox? And I'm talking capital Right. So that's something that's very important. That was the main thing I actually studied the Denisian corpus about when I was uh, publishing on Mariology. Um, but there's other things. It's the earliest witness to the canonicity of, to the book of Revelation. So for those interested in biblical canon questions, um, Denisius is really important because it shows the acceptance of the book of Revelation. He quotes it essentially right after it was written. He writes to St. John as well, by the way. So it's a uh, it's something he received and took as, yeah, this came from Apostle John. It's scripture. It has the earliest reference to the Dormition of the Theotokos, right? So this is important because we see apologists say, oh, these Marian doctrines come from the 5th, 6th century. We have an eyewitness to the Theotokos um, Dormition. He writes about it. So now it's it's being that's an eyewitness account. You don't get a more reliable primary source than that. Now, like, I understand if we're going to be very uh, skeptical. Um, in murder trials, we need multiple witnesses because just because someone's alive today in 2023 doesn't mean they won't lie, right? So none of this proves that Denisius wasn't a liar, right? I mean, perish the thought that's impious for us Orthodox. But speaking purely historically, of course, we can't say, well, we can't prove that he wasn't a liar, but what we could prove, we have a first century attestation of an eyewitness of what occurred, right? And that's that's very important because then you start getting second, third, fourth, fifth century, and then you start realizing what's our basis for rejecting this historically. And we start seeing just because people don't want to believe it. It's not based on historical evidence. It's not based on sacred tradition because the church, Christians have always accepted this into the Protestant Reformation. So if it's not history and it's not sacred tradition, then what's our basis for not accepting this? It's a good question. And that will really change how 
Protestant um, apologetics will have to deal with this stuff. Ultimately, it could be the end of Protestantism without a second reformation where they're going to reform themselves along um, orthodox lines. And of course, this would only be among the dying magisterial Protestant sects, Lutheranism, Anglicanism, you know, not Baptist and stuff like that. They're, they're so far gone. They, they wouldn't even be concerned about this. Um, the Domitian Corpus also contains the earliest description of the liturgy of monasticism. Um, it corroborates archaeological evidence that we had even churches in the early second century that were church buildings, not just house churches. Um, you know, so it's, it's incredible stuff. I, and I think to scholarship at large, the idea that Christian philosophy was the basis for Neoplatonism turns everything on its head. It's, it's incredible. And, and just mainstream stuff, read St. Justin Martyr and St. Athena Goras and St. Aristides. And they men, they speak of things that are later picked up upon a Neoplatonist and no one denies their authenticity from the second century. So what was going on among Christian philosophers in the second century that the pagan philosophers had to catch up with? You know, I, I think it's someone who's genius, like the Nisi Areopagite. It's his shoulders, ultimately, that the Athenian apologists and later the Alexandrian apologists were standing on. And the Neoplatonist movement surfaced in Alexandria. So it really all stems from Christian philosophy. I think that's very concise. And look, I'm, would lo I, I always love your work. And I think this is another direction that you've um, done a good job in. So um, I'm giving you a pat on the back. That's really. I'm giving cool. Evangelos the pat on the back. It, you know, he came up with a genius thesis, and I read it with a very critical eye, not convinced of it, looking the poke holes in it, and he was just right. He was he, this. The evidence was all there. Um, I had very precise etymological um, objections, like, oh, well, this term was used in Chalcedon, so it's anachronistic and stuff like that. And he answered all these objections. And without knowing, you know, he didn't know me from a hole in the wall, obviously, and he didn't know what I was thinking about this and what I've studied. And so I'm honored that I was able to read it, authenticate what he's saying, and, and assist him in writing an even stronger thesis, which I feel was, is going to make a big difference in apologetics and in scholarship. Yeah, I, I can't wait to read that. I also, am, if, <laughs> I'm sold on getting your book as well. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you sold one copy from the show. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I really want to learn more about these things. So yeah, that, that's incredible that they were able to find all that evidence. That's, that's insane. You well, know that's who's the... really happy? Were the monks at St. Denis, the Monastery in St. James, New York. Um, I said, hey, this is a book you got to read. I mailed them a couple copies. And, you know, because that's their namesake, right? Oh, and good. so it's... Uh, you know, uh, the idea is we got to get it published. We got to get this information um, in Romania, in Russia, in, in very strong parts of the Orthodox old world, because this is a thesis that I feel will vindicate some of Orthodoxy's greatest scholars. Um, like I said, like Stan Alloy, um, you know, on questions like this. So what's next? Uh, what's the, your next area of study? What are you going to, what, what's new? I, th I keep saying, I think I'm done. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and, and God keeps providing things, but I, I really, at this juncture, feel like I must get less and other people must get greater. You know, like I, I feel, you know, the rise and fall of the papacy sort of book where it's like a once in a lifetime sort of book. I feel on a topic like this and a topic so important. And then like literally right after I'm done writing this, I get involved with what I just said. It's honestly, like we're not trying to hype it. If what I just said about Denise is correct, how is that not the most important, you know, conclusion of Christian scholarship of the 21st century? And what could top it? You would have to discover a third letter, letter of Corinthians from St. Paul in an Egyptian desert or something that's authentic or something. It's it do it's that important. So I just don't see where I go from here. Maybe you um, could find the third letter of Corinthians in an Egyptian desert or something. No, it's I have no archaeology experience. You know, I, I've read manuscripts and, and stuff like that, but I have no archaeology experience. 
But w- what I'll say is, you know, keep hammering away the, at the mission in Cambodia and evangelism. And um, I do, I do have this one vision, which I'm working on and God has to provide the time. I want to work on a documentary of the history of Christian art, work with father Stephen Bigham on this. And uh, uh, I forget the, I, I know his real name, but he doesn't go by this on the internet. So I don't want to say it. Um, I, there's a documentary filmmaker I, I collaborate with and know him in the real world. And a, it starts from the first century and it just shows the development of Christian art century after century, kind of like the rise of all the papacy, but video form because it's art. It should be visual because I feel yeah. the visual element will really draw people into the importance of icons historically. And, and now, like I'm saying, now that we have someone given the theological rationale for iconodulia explicitly um, from the first, second century, now we can start piecing together the first, second, third century icons, the fourth century and on. And then in visual form, it's just going to be very, very powerful, both historically and for the sake of evangelism. Because I, the main thing I find, you guys tell me what you think, is the main objection Protestants have to orthodoxy is the saints and icons. And it's, 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 it's rabid. Yeah, I, I've... Um, um... Yeah, I've dealt with a lot, like, biggest question I get from inquirers is about, like, the saints and the icons and how they're not biblical. But I, I've, at this point, I actually have, like, several references just on hand now just to go through uh, of, like, you know, biblical references of iconography. And then, like, you know. Uh, or St. Luke alone. And, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and... Uh, the um, and how uh, you know the prayers of the saints are so powerful like you know and, and it's referenced from like like all across the New Testament and even in like revelations and yeah I just have these on hand now because it's just such a common question people people especially Protestants are very you know wary of icons because um, they've got it hammered into them that uh, iconography is uh, idolatry. They for, they I noticed the biggest thing is that they um, take the commandment have no graven imagery, but take it as have no imagery, and it, ignore the key word graven. You know n- don't have and you and know they, the previous and one. The context. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need you need further context you need to like really yeah you really need to f- take in the bible in its full in its fullness not just verse by like not just like taking a verse by itself and then chopping it up which i see yeah just... it's it, it's regrettable but th- that is the approach and that's why i feel a visual documentary where you hear the first second third century rationales of Icons existence, how they're used. And then you see first, second, third century Christian art, um, like the catacomb paintings where you see the woman praying hands upright and you see her eyes pointing up and you look up and there, and there's the icon of the good shepherd. <laughs> yeah. right? And so it's like, well, look, clearly this is what's going on. And I think it gets very hard to reject if you're seeing it visually in a documentary like format. And so if, if anyone could pray for, well, Craig's next project, you get it done, is that God will provide the time for for me to do that. Because making a movie script is, which I've done a couple, like little, you know, my documentaries, is a different sort of thing than writing a book. It's a different sort of thing than a re- response video or a stream or whatever. And so it takes its own sort of work and time. And it's something I think, uh, if God blesses it, will be really effective. Well, I think to let's, I will definitely all be praying for you. And if you're watching in the audience, thank you for watching. And please go ahead and pray for Craig. Check out his book. He does great work. And as Link usual, in the description. Definitely. And as usual, <laughs> it's it's always a pleasure to have him on. And I think we're going to do this every single season. So thank you, Craig. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. <laughs>